I am Dr. Afroz Alam. I am presently working as Assistant Professor of Political Science at National Law University, Orissa, Kattak. Today we are going to discuss the module Rule of Law and Justice. This is a part of the paper module Advanced Jurisprudence. Let us have an introduction of this topic. Interestingly, the conception of the rule of law was held by all as one of the great features of just society. The rule of law as a yardstick also have been advanced as an ultimate value by which to judge the justness of a society. It embodies certain standards that define the characteristic virtues of a legal system as such. However, for many, the idea of justice is looked upon with subjection to law. The alternative to the rule of law is discretionary rule and is to be inevitably opposed. As we know, the focus of the much academic legal work has always been to develop theoretical and functional understanding of the phenomena of rule of law to ensure justice in society. In this pursuit, various theories came up which tried to identify the essential or defining features of the rule of law. Certainly, certain fair abstract questions need to be addressed first. What is law? What constitutes rule of law? How does the rule of law operate in the society? What are the connections between the rule of law and justice? Increasingly, however, the academic discipline of law, as it has become less doctrinal and more policy-oriented, it involves the investigation and presentation of the substantive and procedural rules and principles, which are regarded as authoritative within the jurisdiction in question. It also examines and evaluates the role of a law within different types of society, so as to test the principles of legislation to test standards for substantively good or accepted law. Rule of law, as being pointed by William H. Newcomb, the founder and CEO of the World Social Project. He is saying that the rule of law is the foundation for communities of opportunities and equity. It is the predicate for eradication of poverty, violence, corruption, pandemics, and other threats to civil society. Let me first tell you what is the objectives and the learning of outcomes I have set for this module. After going through this unit, you should be able to understand the meaning and nature of law, understand the meaning, nature, and features of the rule of law, understanding the overarching theoretical frameworks of rule of law and justice developed in legal academics. Reflect and you will also be able to reflect upon legal justice both procedural and substantive. You will also be able to articulate your own position in a clear, coherent, and logical manner on the issues of rule of law and justice. But first, let us begin with the question. The most important one is what is law? It is argued that law is the characteristic of a situation where an object or individual behaves uniformly under specific conditions, indicating regularities of behavior. It is further argued that law is responsible for all orderliness in the universe and society. In a sense, there are two types of laws, scientific and stipulative. Scientific law exists and operates in the universe independently of our will. For example, law of gravitation. While stipulative law determines what an individual should or should not do under specified conditions, these rules are framed with binding effect and enforced by sanctions. It can be changed according to our needs and mode of thinking. In a general sense, Law constitute a set of rules, including, as said earlier, commands, prohibitions, and entitlements. However, what is it that distinguishes law from other social rules? First, law is made by the government and so applies throughout society. In that way, law reflects the will of the state and therefore takes precedence over all other norms and social rules. For, for instance, Conformity to the rules of a sports club, church, or trade union does not provide citizens with immunity if they have broken the law of the land. Secondly, law is compulsory. Citizens are not allowed to choose which laws to obey and which has to ignore because law is backed up by a system of coercion and punishment. The third is law has a public quality and in that it consists of published and recognized rules. This is in part achieved by enacting law through a formal and usually public legislative process. Moreover, the punishments handed down for law breaking are predictable 
and can be anticipated, whereas arbitrary arrest or imprisonment has a random and dictatorial character. Fourth and finally, law is usually recognized as binding upon those to whom it applies, even if particular law may be regarded as unjust or unfair law. Law is therefore more than simply a set of enforced commands. It also embodies moral claims, implying that legal rules should be obeyed. Let us look upon the question which is most contested one. As we know that the most central question in the philosophy of law is to know what is law which we have just discussed. And the another question is what is the nature of law? There are certainly, the, the, these are certainly the big and most contested questions. Hart, H.L.A. Hart in his book, The Concept of Law, argued that in order to answer this question, one must first be able to answer these three questions. And what is that? First, how do you, how do law and legal obligation differ from and how they are related to orders backed by threats? Second, how does legal obligation differ from and how is it related to moral obligations? And the third is what are rules and to what extent is law an unfair, is an affair of rules? These questions highlight three strands of philosophical theorizing about law if you will look at these questions very closely. And what are these three philosophical strands? The first one is, the first question, law and, law and its relation to coercion promotes the version of positivism, which emphasizes that law is a man-made institution of political power, and as such, is the means by which the state organizes its day-to-day -day regulation of its subjects by laying down standards backed up by the threat of sanction. The second question draws our attention to the natural law tradition, which holds that for a legal system to count as genuinely lawful, it cannot depart too from the dictates of morality. And the third and the final question exposes how the law can be seen as a form of communal practical reason, that is to say, a social institution by which people coordinate their behavior to achieve goals they could not achieve simply by acting independently. Let us look at, let us discuss the following philosophical strands to understand the nature of law in short details. The first one is the nature of law tradition. The one from the time of the ancient Greeks until the 16th or 17th century, there was essentially only one philosophy of law and that is natural law. Originally, its purpose was to explain the nature of morality and also seeing law as representing binding obligations arising from the moral sphere. The basic idea was that man using his reason and possibly with the help of revelation of the gods or God could come to understand how he should act rightly in respect of his fellow man. Natural law explains what is it to rule and legislate and judge cases rightly. Natural law is the morality of law narrowly construed as the laws passed by legislation and legal system of courts, judges and so on. The natural law ideas were largely overshadowed by the positivist legal theory from the 19th century onwards. Nevertheless, the question of law and morality revived again in the early 20th century with the emergence of modern totalitarian state in the 1930s as we have seen the emergence of fascist, Nazi and communist state. The relevance of positivist school was challenged by the modern naturalist. Here the, here, the procedural naturalism of Fuller and natural right theory of John Finnis deserves a special mentioning. Let us look at the second strand of philosophical reasoning so far as the law is concerned, and that is legal positivism. Law is to be a particular sort of social ordering, ordering, a certain kind of social technology by which individuals who live together can coordinate their behavior and resolve disputes. The idea of legal positivism here is that law is man-made either by judges or legislatures or collectively by custom. If it is not made, it is not law. It sees all law as positive, as direct command of a competent authority, enforceable by effective sanctions. Jeremy Bentham in his book, A Fragment on Garment, and the second book, An Introduction to the Principles of Law, Moral and Legislations. John Austin in his book, The Province of Jurisprudence Determined, and Hans Kelsen, General Theory of Law and State, and H.L.A. Hart, The Concept of Law, are all the examples of positivism. R. Durkin, 
taking his, his book, taking rights seriously, and Joseph Ross, the authority of law, are to be treated as post-Hartian analytical theory, so far as legal positivism is concerned. So in nutshell, legal positivism emphasizes that law is a man-made institution. Second, let us focus on the third strand of, of philosophy, that is legal evolutionism. In that legal evolutionism was developed by Savigny and Henry Main. Savigny identified law as the expression of the spirit of a particular people, the race as well as custom, culture. For him, custom is the fundamental form of law because it is originated in the life of the people. Legislations are merely advice of translating particular consciousness into enactments. Henry Main and his ancient law rejected Savigny's approach and argued that progressive societies are characterized by a movement from status to contract. In short, law has no fixed content. Change in social institutions and awareness bring about corresponding changes in the substance of law. This is all the focus of legal evolutionism. The fourth strand is sociological jurisprudence has been developed by Dickett, Hugo Crabbe, Roscoe Pond. They are the greatest exponent of this school. What this theory emphasizes is that state is not the source of law, which is quite contrary to the school of positivism. It is, they emphasizes that it is only an agency to impute legal value to the rules which already exist in the society to take care of social interest. Law for this school is therefore not only prior to the state, but also superior to the state. Law is to solve social problems and achieve social progress and thus open to interpretation and revision in the light of changing levels of social consciousness. Pound argues that proper function of the law is social engineering, which has completely changed the dimensions of our thinking so far as the legal understanding is concerned. Substance of the law is to be determined with reference to the social purpose which it is designed to solve. This is the core of this particular school of thought. But before we move ahead, let us resolve the question, what is the rule of law? The rule of law is a constitutional principle, respected with almost devotional intensity in liberal democratic state. At heart, it is quite simply the principle that the law should rule, that it should provide a framework within which all citizens act and beyond, which no one, neither private citizens nor government officials should go. Without the protection of law, each person is constantly under threat from every other member of society, as indeed they are from him. The fundamental purpose of law is therefore to protect individual right, which in Locke's view means the right to life, liberty, and property. The rule of law, possibly with the pervasiveness of the spirit of law throughout the whole range of government in the sense of excluding arbitrary official action in any sphere. Rule of law is an expression to give a reality to something which is readily expressible. That is why Sir Ivo Jennings said that it is an unruly horse. Rule of law is based upon the liberty of the individual and has its object, the harmonizing of the opposing notions of individual liberty and public order. The notion of justice maintains the balance between the two and justice has a variable content. The supreme virtue of the rule of law is therefore that it serves to protect the individual citizen from the state. It ensures a government of laws and not of man. The idea of rule of law was enshrined in the German concept of the Reichstag, a state based on law which it means. The rule of law, however, has a distinctly Anglo-American character. In the USA, the supremacy of law is emphasized by the status of the US Constitution, by the checks and balances it establishes, and the individual rights outlined in the Bill of Rights. This is made clear in the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendment to the Constitution, which is specifically forbid federal or state government from denying any person life, liberty, and property without due process of law. The doctrine of due process was not not only restrict the discretionary power of the public officials, but also enshrines a number of individual rights, notably the right to a fair trial and to an equal treatment under the law. By contrast, the UK conception of the rule of law has seen it as a typical uncodified constitutional system within which rights and duties are rooted in common law, laws derived from long-established customs and traditions. 
The classical account of such view is found in A.V. Dice's introduction to the st study of the law of the Constitution, which appeared in 1885, and finally in 1939 in revised form. In Dice's view, the rule of law embraces four separate features. One, first, no one should be punished except for breach, breaches of law. This is the most fundamental feature of the rule of law because it distinguishes between the rule-bound government and arbitrary government, suggesting that where the rule of law exists, government cannot simply act as it pleases. For instance, it cannot punish citizens merely because it objects to their opinion or disapproves of their behavior. Second principle of Dicey is the rule of law requires equal subjection to the law more commonly understood as equality before law. Quite simply, the law should be no respecter of a person. It should not discriminate against people on grounds of race, gender, religious creed, social background, and so forth. And it should apply equally to ordinary citizens and to government officials. The third principle is, when law is broken, there must be a certainty of punishment. The law can only rule if it, if it is applied to at all times and in all circumstances. The law rules only selectively when some law breaks are persecuted and punished while others are not. And finally, the rule of law requires that the rights and liberties of the individual are embodied in the ordinary law of the land. This would ensure, Dicey, this would ensure as Dicey hoped, that when individual rights are violated, citizens can readdress th through the courts. In its broad sense, the rule of law is a core liberal democratic principle, embodying ideas such as constitutionalism and limited government to which most modern states aspire. In particular, the rule of law imposes significant constraints upon how law is made and how it is adjudicated. For example, it suggested that all laws should be general in the sense that they apply to all citizens and do not select particular individuals or groups for a special treatment, good or bad. It is for the vital that citizens know where they stand. Laws should therefore be precisely framed and accessible to the public. The rule of, let us look at the rule of law conception in Western political thought. As we know that the rule of law is an ancient ideal. Plato wrote one of the earliest, Plato wrote one of the earliest surviving discussions. While convinced that the best form of government is ruled by a benevolent dictator, Plato concedes that as a, as a practic as practical matter, persons with necessary leadership qualities are rare. Accordingly, he imagines a utopia that is governed not by a benevolent dictator, but by no more the god of law. In the politics, Aristotle also con considers whether it is better for a king to rule by discretion or according to a law and comes down formally on the side of law. Individuals are too often swayed by private passions, he admits. Aristotle observed in his politics, and quote, that he who commands that law should rule may thus be regarded as commanding that, that God and reason alone should rule. He who commands that a man should rule adds the character of the best. Appetite has the character. And high spirit, too, perverts the holders of office, even when they are the best of men. Law, as the pure vice of God and reason, may thus be defined as reason free from all passion. Roman strikes similar, similar like uh, Cicero, who states that, quote, true law is right reason in agreement with nature. It is of universal application, unchanging and everlasting. It summons to duty by its commands and averts from wrongdoing by its prohibitions. We cannot be freed from its obligations by senate or people, and we need, not, we need not look outside ourselves for an expounder or interpreter of it. And there will not be different laws at Rome and at Athens, or different laws now and in the future, but one eternal and unchangeable law will be valid for all nations and at all times, and there will be one master and ruler, that is God, over us all, for he is the author of, of this law, its promulgator and its enforcing judge. Christian philosophers seeing the power to rule as delegation from God. The lawgiver saw any kind, kindly act contrary to natural law as an express violation of this delegation for which a monarch would surely be punished after death. 
Both the early Greeks and the Christian philosopher had a vision of law as a system of rules whose source lay outside of the ruler himself. For the Greeks, law was inherent in the natural order or arose from the timeless customs of the people. For the Christians, law came from God. Accordingly, if a king was were to rule according to law, he would be constrained and his power would be limited. Similarly, and the most recent thinking over the rule of law came from Joseph Raz and his book, The Authority of Law. Let us quote him what he says. He says that the rule of law is essentially a negative value. The law inevitably creates a greater da danger of arbitrary power. The rule of law is designed to minimize the danger created by the law itself. Similarly, the law may be unstable, obscure, retrospective, etc., and thus infringe people's freedom and dignity. The rule of law is designed to prevent this danger as well. Thus, the rule of law is a negative virtue in two senses. Con first, conformity to it does not cause good except through avoiding evil, and the evil which is avoided is evil which would not only have been caused by the law itself. It is thus somewhat analogous to honesty when the virtue is narrowly interpreted as the avoidance of deceit. The good of honesty does not include the good of communication between people, for honesty is consistent with the refusal of communication. It is good, is, its good is exclusively in the avoidance of the harm of deceit and not deceit by others, but by the honest person himself. And therefore, only a person who can deceive can be honest. A person who cannot communicate cannot claim any more merit for being honest. Similarly, let us look at another contemporary thinker whose name is Jeremy Waldron, who completely stunned the internet world thinking so far as the issue of rule of law is concerned. He has written a book, The Concept of Law, where he identified as about rule of law in the following terms. The rule of law is an, uh, is an ideal designed to correct dangers of abuse that arise in general, in general when political power is exercised not dangers of abuse that arise from the law in particular. Indeed, the rule of law aims to correct abuses of power by insisting on a particular mode of exercise of political power, government through law. The mode of governance is, is the more apt to protect us against abuse than say managerial governance or rule by decree. On this account, law itself seems to be prescribed as the remedy rather than identified as the problem that a separate ideal, the rule of law, seeks to remedy. In his view, to describe on, excess and, uh, on exercise of power as an instance of lawmaking or law application is already to dignify it with certain character. It is already to make certain assessment or evaluation of what has happened." Unquote. Let us carry forward our discussion more so far as Western tradition of the rule of law. Jurist and philosopher now distinguishes between two types of rule of law. The first is substantive rule of law, defined to be a rule according to some particular set of laws that are valued for the content such as guarantee of basic human rights. The second is formal or procedural rule of law, defined to be a rule according to any laws generated by some legislative processes, even if they are bad laws. Several other ideas are sometimes swept under the name of rule of law. The idea that the persons in government should themselves be subject to law like any private citizen is another idea that is sometimes discussed under the rule of law. Authoritarian states tend to identify rule of law with law and order, implying not restraints on the government but restraints on citizens. Increasingly, economists have come to realize that the free market depends on certain institutions and the enforcement of certain rules such as freedom to contract and the enforcement of contracts. Uh, contracts. Very recently, economists and development specialists have begun to discuss the rule of law as the enforcement of private contracts. And while the idea of the rule of law describes the way a king should act and by implication, the executive branch may confuse the rule of law with the quality of the court system. As Kulp Davis said, where the law ends, discretion begins. And the exercise of discretions may mean beneficence or tyranny, justice or injustice, either reasonableness or arbitrariness. There has been no government or legal system in world history which did not involve both rules and discretion. It is impossible to find a government of laws alone and not of men in the sense of 
elimination, eliminating all discretionary powers. All governments are government of laws and of man. Jerome Frank has said, this much we can surely say for a struggle from home, Harrington derived the notion of the government of laws and not of man. That notion was not expressive of hostility to what today we call administrative discretion, nor did it has have such a meaning for Harrington. Another definition of rule of law has been given by Frederick A. Haig in his book, The Road of Serfdom and Constitution of Liberty. It is much the same as the propounded by Frank's, Frank's committee in England. What he says, quote, the rule of law stands for the view that the decision should be made by the application of known principle of principles or laws. In general, such decisions will be predictable and the citizens will, come, will know where he is. On the other hand, there is what is arbitrary. A decision may be made without principle, without any rules. It is therefore unpredictable, the antithesis of decision taken in accordance with the, with the rule of law. What good is the rule of law? This is a most important question. The benefit of the rule of law depends on how the rule of law is defined. For the Christian philosopher, the rule of law was identified with the triumph of the substantive commandments of God. It was valuable because it was equivalent to good government. More generally, the advance, advantages of substantive rule of law or the advantages of whatever rules are to be implemented. For example, the guarantee of basic human, human rights or the presumption of innocence. Yet, the narrower procedural definition of the rule of law has virtues as well. It is expected to make government action predictable. This predictability is supposed to encourage investment and allow people to plan their lives meaningfully. Contract enforcement is that it allows people to trade and thus to increase their utility. This is thought to be a superior process of allocation because people have the best knowledge of what goods will satisfy them. For thinkers from the Greeks through, through today, the rule of law protected citizens from a monarch's individual passion and self-dealing. Meaningful law and institutions to change it allows us to more easily identify and change the rules by which our lives are governed, providing a handle for social actions. Recently, in 2014, a World Social Justice Report project came out with its own report, which has developed certain indicators of rule of law in everyday life. Although we may now be aware of it, the rule of law is a profoundly important part of our lives. It is the foundation for a system of rules to keep us safe, resolve disputes, and enable us to prosper. Let us con consider a few examples. Let us take business environment. Imagine an investor seeking to commit resources abroad. She would probably think twice before investing a in a country where corruption is rampant, property rights are ill-defined, and contracts are difficult to enforce, uneven enforcement of Regulation, corruption, insecure property rights, and ineffective means to settle disputes undermine legitimate business and drive away both domestic and foreign investment. Similarly, like public works as an example, consider the bridges, roads, or runways we traverse daily, or the offices and buildings in which we live, work, and play. What if building codes governing their design and safely were not enforced, or if government officials and contractors employed law quality material, low quality materials in order to pocket the surplus. Weak regulatory enforcement and corruption decreases the reliability and security of physical infrastructure and waste scarce resources which are essential to a thriving economy. Let us take the example of civil justice system in a society. Imagine an individual having a dispute with another party. What if the system to settle such a dispute and obtain a remedy was largely inaccessible, unreliable, and corrupt. Without a well-functioning civil justice system, a core element of the rule of law, individuals faced with a dispute have few options other than giving up on an attempt to solve it or resorting to violence or intimidations to settle the conflict. Let us take the another example of public health and environment. Consider the implications of pollution, wildlife, poaching, and deforestation for health the economy and the environment. What if a company was pouring harmful chemicals into a river at a highly populated area and the environmental inspector turned a blind eye in exchange for a bribe, while countries around the world have laws to protect the public health and the environment? These, are, these laws are not always enforced. Adherence to the law, rule of law is essential to effectively enforce public health and environmental regulations 
and to hold the government, business, civil society organizations and communities accountable for protecting the environment without unduly constraining economic opportunities. Take another example of public participation. What if the residents of a neighborhood were not informed of an, up, 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 of an upcoming construction project commissioned by the government that will cause disrupt, disruption to their community? Or what if they did not have an opportunity to present their objections to the relevant government authorities prior to the start of the construction project? Being able to voice opinions about government decisions that directly impact the lives of the ordinary people is a key aspect of the rule of law. Public participation ensures that all stakeholders have the chance to have their voice heard and provide valuable input in the decision-making process. Thus, in a nutshell, the rule of law affects all of us in everyday lives. It is not only important to lawyers and judges, every person is a stakeholder in the rule of law. World Justice Project defines what is the rule of law in its report and that it points, points out like this that that the rule of law has to satisfy following four principles. One, the government and its officials and agents as well as individuals and private entities are accountable under the law. The laws are clear, publicized, stable and just, are applied evenly and protect fundamental rights including the security of persons and property. Third, the process by which the laws are enacted, administered and enforced is accessible, fair and efficient. Justice is delivered timely by competent, ethical and independent representatives and neutral who are of sufficient numbers, have adequate resources and reflect the makeup of the communities they serve. These four universal principles are further developed in the following nine factors, factors of the rule of law index which measures how the rule of law is experienced by ordinary people in 99 countries around the world. This rule of law index is being nicely developed and pointed out by World Justice Project report. Let us look at those factors of rule of law and index. There are nine factors. The one is constraints on economic uh, government powers. In a society governed by the rule of law, the government and its officials and agents are subject to and held accountable under the law. It has six indexes. The one, government powers are effectively limited by the legislature. The government powers are effectively limited by the judiciary. Government powers should be effectively limited by independent auditing and review. Government officials are sanctioned for misconduct. Government powers are subject to non-governmental checks. Transitions of power is subject to the law. The second is absence of corruption. The absence of cor corruption conveniently defined as the use of public power for private gain is one of the hallmark of a society governed by the rule of law. It has four indicators. The government officials in the executive branch do not use public office for private gain. Government officials in the judicial branch do not use public office for private uh, in their gain. Government officials in the police and military do not use public office for private gain. Government officials in the legislative branch do not use public office for private gain. The third factor is open government. Open government is essential to the rule of law. It involves engagement, access, participation and collaboration between the government and its citizens and plays a crucial role in the promotion of the rule of law. It has four indexes. The one is the laws are publicized and accessible. Laws are stable. The third one is the raw right to petition the government and public participation. Fourth one is office information available on request. The another factor is fundamental rights. Under the rule of law, fundamental rights must be effectively guaranteed. It has eight indexes to judge whether fundamental rights are effectively protected or not. The first one is equal treatment and the absence of discriminations. Second, the right to life and security of the person is effectively guaranteed. Third, due process of law and rights of the accused is guaranteed. Fourth, freedom of opinion and expression is effectively guaranteed. Fifth, the freedom of belief and religion is effectively guaranteed. Freedom of, from arbitrary interference with privacy is also being ensured. Freedom of assembly and association is also being guaranteed. Fundamental labor rights are effectively guaranteed. Another factor is order and security. Human security is one of the defining aspects of any rule of law society. Protecting human security, mainly assuring the security of a person and property is a fundamental function of the state. It has three indexes. Crime is effectively controlled. Civil conflict is effectively limited. People do not resort to violence to redress 
personal grievances. And another factor is regulatory enforcement. Public enforcement of a government regulation is pervasive in modern societies as a method to include induce conduct. It has five indexes. First, the government regulations are effectively enforced. Our government regulations are applied and enforced without proper improper influence. Administrative proceedings are conducted without unreasonable delay. Due process is respected in administrative proceedings. Fifth, the government does not expropriate without lawful process and adequate compensation. Another factor is civil justice. In a rule of law society, ordinary people should be able to resolve their grievances and obtain remedies in conformity with the fundamental rights through formal institutions of justice in a peaceful manner. It has seven indicators. The one people can access and afford civil justice. Civil justice is free of discrimination. It is free of corruption. It is free of improper government influence. It is not subject to unreasonable delay. It is effectively enforced. ADR is accessible, impartial, and effective. Another factor is criminal justice of rule of law. An effective criminal justice is a key aspect of rule of law as it constitutes the natur natural mechanism to redress grievances and bring actions against individuals for offenses against offenses against. It has seven indicators. Criminal investigation system is effective. It is criminal adjudication system is timely and effective. Correctional system is effective in reducing criminal behavior. Criminal system is impartial. It is free of corruption. It is free of important government influence. Due process of law and rights of the accused are being guaranteed. Another factor is informal justice. For many countries, it is important to acknowledge the role played by traditional or informal systems of the law, including traditional, tribal and religious code as well as community based. It has three indicators. The one is informal justice is timely and effective. It is impartial and free of improper influence. It is, uh, it is respected and protects fundamental rights. Let us go with certain criticism of the rule of law. Nevertheless, the rule of law also has its has critics. Some have, for instance, suggest that it is a truism to say that the law rules, law rules may acknowledge nothing more than that citizens are compelled to obey it. In this narrow sense, the rule of law is reduced to the statement that everybody must obey the law. Others have argued that the principles pays little attention to the content of law. Even its keenest defenders will acknowledge that although the rule of law may be necessary condition for a just government, it is not in itself a sufficient one. Marxist critics go further. However, Marxists have traditionally regarded law not as a safeguard for individual liberty, but as a means for securing property rights and protecting the capitalist system. For them, the law, like politics and ideology, was a part of the superstructure conditioned by the economic base. In this case, the capitalist mode of production law thus protects private property, social inequality, and class domination. Feminists have also drawn attention to biases that operate through the system of law. In this case, biases that favor the interests of men at the expense of the women as a result, for instance, of a predominantly made male judiciary and legal profession. Multicultural theorists have, for their part, argued that law reflects the values and attitudes of the dominant culture, cultural group and so is insensitive to the values and concerns of the minority groups. Rule of, let us look at another more important and related uh, dimensions of the law in relation with the justice. How a rule of law and legal justice is connected? Let us first point out the legal justice. What legal justice really means? Legal justice is concerned with the way in which law distributes penalties for, wrong, or for wrongdoings or allocates compensation in the case of injury or damage. Justice in this sense clearly involves the creation and enforcement of a public set of rules but to be just, these rules must themselves have immoral underpinnings. Two forms of justice can be identified at work in the legal process. First, the, first there is a procedural justice which relates to law, which, which relates to how the rules are made and applied. Second, there is a substantive justice which is concerned with the rules themselves and whether they are just or unjust. Let us look at the question of procedural justice in more detail. Procedural or formal justice refers to the manner in which decisions are, are outcomes are achieved as opposed to the content of the decisions made. There are those, for instance, who suggest that legal justice is not, as, is not so much concerned with the outcomes of law, judgments, verdicts, sentences, and so forth, as with how these outcomes are arrived at. There is no doubt that on certain occasions, justice is entirely a procedural matter, a just 
an acceptable outcome is guaranteed by the application of a particular procedural rules. This clearly applies, for example, in the case of a sporting competition. The object of a running race is to establish quite simply who is the fastest runner. Justice in this respect is achieved if procedural rules are applied which ensure that all factors other than running talent are irrelevant to the outcome of the race. Thus, justice demands that every competition runs the same distance, competitor runs the same distance, that they start at the same time, that none enjoys an unfair advantage gaining through the performance enhancing drafts and officials adjudicating the race are impartial and so on. Legal system can claim to be just in precisely the same way. They operate according to an established set of rules designed to ensure a just outcome. In short, justice is seen to be done. These procedural rules can however take one of the two forms. In the case of what John Rawls called pure procedural justice, the question of justice is solely determined by the application of the just procedures as with the example of a running race or a lottery. In a court of law, on the other hand, there is a prior knowledge of what would constitute a just outcome, in which case the justice of the procedure consists of their tendency to pro produce that outcome. For example, in a criminal trial, that the procedure, procedural rules are designed to ensure that the guilty are punished, that punishment fits the crime, and so forth. At the heart of the procedural justice stand the principle of formal equality. The law should be applied in a manner that does not discriminate between individuals on grounds like gender, race, religion, or social background. This in turn requires that law be impartially applied, which can only be achieved if judges are strictly independent and unbiased. Moreover, the legal system must acknowledge the possibility that mistakes can be made and provide some machinery through which these can be rectified. This is achieved in practice through a hierarchy of courts, high courts being able to consider appeals from lower courts. Procedural justice is also said to require the presumption that the accused is innocent until proved guilty. This has been described as the golden thread running through the English legal system and those derived from it. The presumption of innocence ensures that, there mu that, that the mere fact of an accusation does not in itself constitute proof. The onus is on the prosecution to offer evidence which can prove guilty beyond reasonable doubt. This is also why certain evidence for, why certain evidence, for instance about the accused previous criminal record, may be inadmissible in a court, since it could taint the jury's view and prevent a verdict being reached on the face of the case. In the same way, an accused person has traditionally been accorded a right to silence on the grounds that it is the prosecution's job to establish guilt. There is a constitutional guarantee to enjoy the rights to avoid self-incrimination. Let us look at the second part of the justice, which is more uh, substantive in character, that is known as substantive justice. The require, it talks about that the requirement of legal justice cannot be entirely met by the application of procedural rules, however fair these rules may be. The outcomes of the law and not merely its procedures are claimed to be just. Thus, procedural fairness or with some more robust outcome related conception of substantive fairness according to which an outcomes that resulted from a perfectly fair procedure might nonetheless be substantively unfair and require amelioration. The legal pro process may thus generate injustice not because law is unfairly applied but because law itself is unjust. The content of the law must therefore be judged in the light of a principle of substantive or concrete justice. The substantive justice is contested concept. Legal justice has traditionally been linked to the idea that the law aims to treat people according to their just deserts or, the, or in the words of the Roman Emperor Justinian, justice means giving each man his due. Here supporters of retribution may argue that in principle justice demand that the murderers murderous life be forfeited in punishment for his crime. Those who advocate deterrence may accept capital punishment, but only when empirical evidence indicates that it will reduce the number of murders. Rehabilitation theorists reject capital punishment in all circumstances, regarding it as little more than a form of legalized murder. The idea of substantive justice is subjective. It varies from individual to individual, from group to group, from society to society, and from period to period. Indeed, the decline of religion and traditional values and the growth of both social and geographical mobility has encouraged the development of moral pluralism. Ethical and cultural diversity make it impossible to make any form or authoritative judgments about the moral content of law or to establish reliable criterion for distinguish just laws from unjust ones. 
Patrick Delvin proposed that law should enforce law should enforce morally. In Devlin's view, law is based upon the moral values of the average citizen, or in his words, the man on the Calfum omnibus. Thus, he proposed a distinction between what he called consensus laws and non-consensus laws. Consensus laws are one which conform to commonly held standards of fairness or justice. They are the laws which, in Delvin's view, people are prepared to put up with. On the other hand, non-consensus consensus laws are ones widely regarded as unacceptable or unjust normally reflected in the fact of wide expressed disobedience. Devlin did not go as far as to suggest that breaking non-consensus laws was justified, but he nevertheless warned that their enforcement would only bring the judiciary and the legal process into disrepute. The danger of Devlin's argument is that it threatens to classify most laws as non-consensus on the grounds that somebody or, or other is not prepared to put up with them. This leads to a difficult question about how many people need to object and what form their objection need to be, ta need to be taken before a law can be regarded as non-consensus. Such difficulties, however, merely reflect a deeper problem. In many respects, the idea of a consensus mor morality Consensus morality is simply a hangover from the days of traditional and homogeneous communities. In modern societies characterized by ethnic, religious, and racial, cultural, and moral pluralism, any attempt to identify consensus belief is doomed to be failure. Let us conclude. To sum up, the idea of rule of law proposes that the function of law is to guide the behavior of its subjects, and this puts constraint on the creation, character, and application of law. The list of constraints include law should be general, publicly proclaimed, prospective rather than retrospective, clear rather than vague, and not overly complex, reasonable, reasonably stable, possible to comply with, and applied consistently in accordance to their tenor. None of these constraints as for fuller are absolute. The compliance with the rule of law is a matter of more or less. In this absence of rule of law, which is the foundation of justice, people are unable to have their voice heard, exercise their rights, challenge discrimination, or hold decision makers accountable. According to the United Nations Secretary General in 2005, he says, the protection and promotion of the universal values of the rule of law, human rights, and democracy are ends in themselves. They are also essential for a world of justice, opportunity, and stability. Let us look at the one famous case which came out in 1996. That is, known as Dalmia Cement Bharat Limited versus Union of India, which rightly observes that law is the manifestation of principle of justice, equity, and good conscience. Rule of law should establish a uniform pattern for harmonious existence in a society where every individual would exercise his rights to his best advantage to achieve excellence, subject to protective discrimination. Man's existence is a creature of substantive and procedural law to which legal incidents would attract would attach. Justice, equity, and fraternity are trinity for social and economic equality. Law is an instrument of social change as also a defender for social change. Thank you.